Jeremiah 18, verse 5 to 6 says this. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Declares the Lord, behold, like clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And I sense as we were worshiping that song, as the Spirit of God was breathing new life, He's actually refashioning each one of you and me to be vessels that can be fit for the Master's use. And when you're under the potter's shaping hands, uh, you feel being bent out of shape, isn't it? You feel like, Lord, I like my ways. I like the way things are. I pretty much planned out my life, and yet, when the clay is being wet and reshaped, it's like you feel like you're turning into something you didn't think you were or wanted to be. And I think that's what the Lord's been doing this last three years. I was really struck when uh, the spiel I was reading earlier, it's been three years since the lockdowns. This month, three years ago, was when the lockdowns happened. It's not just two years, it's three years now. And I was struck by the, re the Spirit reminding me that Jesus was started His ministry for three years, some say three and a half years. And when you look at His life, it was summed up in the Matthew, Isaiah prophecy used in Matthew. He was a man of sorrows. He was, his face when he was crucified was barred beyond this and was disfigured. It's like those three years were not really days of rejoicing, but it was suffering, if you will. But yet we know that's not the end of the story. And that's the word of encouragement for you in this three years of suffering, if you will. The Lord has been preparing us because their suffering always precedes glory. And I declare to you today, three years is over and God is saying, I'm doing something new in the earth today. It's over. His kingdom is coming in a new way. Let's go ahead and take our seats. I want to go straight into the Word this morning, this afternoon. We are trusting that the promise of God that He's going to pour out His Spirit afresh amongst us and in our midst, He will fulfill. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and address them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The day of salvation had come upon Israel through the outpouring of the Spirit and Peter's preaching, quoting from the book of Joel. As you're aware of, that was the occasion of the Feast of Pentecost, which is one of three annual festivals preceded by Passover 50 days earlier, which was when Christ was crucified and after three days rose again from the dead. And so it was times of perhaps confusion and misunderstanding what was really happening, but when Pentecost came and the Spirit was poured out, then there was such a clarity as Peter declared what was happening in their day. This was the fulfillment of the promise. 
of God through Joel that there will be an outpouring. You know, the word outpouring, we use that often, but outpouring, if you look at its application, simply means an inexhaustible supply of whatever it is you're pouring. Meaning the coming of the Spirit was something that was going to be inexhaustible 2,000 years ago to the 21st century. There is still a supply from heaven for in the person of the Spirit. And so this was the fulfillment. But what I want to focus on briefly is a statement that Peter makes that Joel didn't say. And that word is the last days. What was the last days? Joel never said that. But Peter says, this, what you see, is the beginning of the last days. And so, I think we need to put a context to it because, see, the Israelites had been subjugated for about 100 years by the Romans and prior to that by the Babylonians, Medo-Persians, and Greeks. 400 years, they were subjugated by different foreign powers. It's kind of like our country, isn't it? I think if there's one country that can identify with Israel, it's us. For 400 years, isn't it, we've been subjugated and colonized by three superpowers. And often we can feel like, are we really free, even though there's no more foreign power in our midst. But here, when finally Jesus rose from the dead, the Jewish were excited. And here in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says here, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, that you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel. See, they were longing for the fulfillment, the promise of a Messiah coming, and they will set, he will set up a kingdom while they were slaves for 400 years. Maybe we were waiting for a Rizal. Maybe we were waiting for a Bonifacio. Okay, if I could use our own history as an example. They were waiting for a hero. And Jesus seemed to fit the bill, although he doesn't seem like a military commander. He doesn't seem like this conquering king. He was a suffering servant. But yet when he rose from the dead, see their understanding of the kingdom was, yes, when the Messiah would come, the old age would end and a new age would begin. And so when Je they asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? Jesus said, no, no. It's not for you to know the time set by the Father, by his own authority. So he wasn't dismissing the statement of the disciples for the restoration as Israel understood it. But in effect, what Jesus was saying to them was, yes, the kingdom of God has come now, but it's much bigger and it's much different from what you thought it was. Because they thought Israel, with old Israel, the old age would end and a new age would come. Jesus was saying to them, no. Actually, while you're still being subjugated, while you're still under Roman occupation, the kingdom has already come in Christ, of course. But then, not just in Christ, but now through the Holy Spirit. See, after this, Jesus ascended to heaven and the Holy Spirit descended into earth. Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. You know, it reminds me of the ladder that Jacob saw, isn't it? Where the angels were ascending and descending from heaven. Brothers and sisters, okay, for especially for you boomers, this is the original stairway to heaven, okay? What am I saying? Because Jesus had already been raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of the Father, the reality and the power of the future kingdom had now come into the present in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Again, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God simply is the rule and reign of God in the earth. They didn't want Babylonian rule. They didn't want Roman rule. They didn't want Greek rule. They wanted God's rule. That's what they were longing for. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 5 says this. 
We have been given a taste. If we shared in the Holy Spirit, you tasted the goodness of God and the power of the age to come. I, wanna, I want you to take note of that. This is a word that's not commonly used, but I hope you'll discover something through this. So again, what are the last days? See, the outpouring of the Spirit ushered in what Peter called the last days, which is the present age that is existing to this day, characterized by evil and sickness and death and disease and poverty and injustice and everything else that you find wrong in this world. That's the evil age, and unfortunately, we're still in it. But when Jesus rose again from the dead, of course, he announced it even in his life, and the Spirit came into heaven, the new age had already come. And it will speed to its end at the last day. And using Hebrews 6 verse 4, he says, Now we have access to the power of the coming age. The power of the coming age while we are still living in the present age. Okay, let me be clear. What am I saying? We're actually living in two ages at the same time. The present evil age characterized by what I said evil. And the new age characterized by power and life and salvation and healing and deliverance. Come on, and miraculous provision and all that. Now let me put it this way. Some of you in Katipunan heard this. We've been so enamored by the multiverse, isn't it? Um, one of my favorite scenes, and everybody saw it for the first time when Spider-Man No Way Home was shown. None of us, they kept it under wraps, okay? And when Tom Holland was going through all of his facing the enemy and he thought he was going to be defeated, suddenly out from nowhere, you know, this heavens opened and Andrew Garfield comes in, isn't it? And then after that, Tobey Maguire. And everybody was like, ah! He was going to get help. Isn't it? Of course, with Michelle Yeoh winning and Doctor Strange too, isama mo na lahat sila. And see, the multiverse is, uh, is a fascinating concept. It's actually a mathematical theory. It's like throwing a dice. And remember, there's six possible outcomes, isn't it? And it's like six possible universes that exist. Now, that's a wonderful thought, isn't it? For you scientific people. I, I thought of it, wow, maybe that's possible. But after reflecting, I realized at best, it's fiction, brothers and sisters. It can't happen. But you know what can happen? And what's happened that we've experienced? It's not about the multiverse. It's about the future verse. It's about the future. Come on. The future invading the present. It's about what's happening, the power of the age to come has now come in the person of the Holy Spirit. See, when the Holy Spirit comes, brothers and sisters, the future age has now come into you and me. So now, come on, we have the ability and the capacity and the privilege of experiencing the power of the future presently right now. How many of you know, come on, we don't have to live by our own abilities. We don't have to live and trust the multiverse to help us. Come on, the future verse has come. By the way, future verse is my invention, okay? So that's not, that's not a biblical word, just in case. I'm not preaching heresy. I'm preaching the truth that God's word says. The future age has now come. See, Paul says the Holy Spirit is like a down payment. It's like a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. How many of you know you have an inheritance in Christ? Come on, in the kingdom. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And we already have a foretaste of it, as Hebrews says. So what does that mean in our present time? It means three things. As I end this brief message, going back to what Acts chapter 2 says. When the Spirit has come, 
the first manifestation of the Spirit's coming is that now God becomes a personal presence. He said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Every single one of you. Come on, if you have flesh. How many of you have flesh? All right. Now, remember, flesh is used two ways. Flesh, sinful nature, which is not what is being said here, but flesh and blood, if you will, on all flesh. In the Old Testament, only a few selected people could have the Holy Spirit with them. Remember, the Spirit is the third person in the Godhead. Only those who were handpicked by God for service. David, Samson, uh, Gideon, and several other people. The problem was, and they were used for service, Oholiel, Bezalel, and Oholiab. They were artists. Come on. Artists can be filled with the Spirit. Come on, to bring creativity. And he said, and then when, when they would be used by God for service, but whenever they rebelled or sinned against God, the Spirit would lead them. Remember that? When Samson compromised, the Spirit left him, and even Saul that's why when David sinned, when he was crying out for God's mercy, he said in Psalm 51, renew, uh, uh, what's the verse, okay? Cast me not away from your presence, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. As anointed as David was when he sinned, his greatest fear was that the Holy Spirit would leave him. Well, guess what? In the new covenant, come on, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and will stay and dwell in you and me forever. And so you're, you can be as close to God as you want. From the greatest to the smallest to the least, every single one of you have God living in you. The second blessing is He gives us the power to proclaim His word. He says that sons and daughters will prophesy. And we're going to hear some of that later on from our other speakers. But the final one, the third one, I want to share with you, which I believe God wants to do afresh today. And, he's going to, and it's this. He's going to reveal His calling upon you through dreams and visions. The late Paul Yonggi Cho said this, dreams and visions are the language of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you have dreams and visions, and when I say dreams and visions, it's not so much about having this wild dream if you had a big meal at night, after you have your samgyupsal, okay? Tapos pagtulog mo, wow, bangungot yun, mga kapatid. Hindi po pa naginip yun. When I talk about dreams and visions, I'm talking about kingdom causes. When Goliath was taunting the Israelites, David said, Who's this uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of God? And his brother said, Hey, tumabi kang ajak. And David said, Can't I even speak? Is there not a cause? How many of you, there's so many causes in this nation and many nations that need a David, come on, that need a man and a woman of God to serve and to lead. Brothers and sisters, God wants to pour out fresh dreams and visions upon you. In fact, some of you are, don't have need to have fresh dreams and visions. You need a resurrection of your dreams and visions. But if you feel like your dreams have died, is it possible that God wants to give you a new dream and a new vision? And when all is said and done, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all nations. And that's how everything that we're doing, everything that we're experiencing, the remolding, the reshaping of our lives, brothers and sisters, is going to make sense. As I close, I want to pray for you. And we're going to have a time where we allow the Spirit of God to do a renewing work, a refreshing work in all of us so that we might experience the presence and the power of the Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit has come to dwell in each one of our lives. And He wants to renew you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore your soul. 
He wants to reshape you. He wants to mold you and make you a vessel fit for the master's use. I'd like us to stand up. Let's pray. Lord, you said in your word, if we repent and we're baptized, Lord, we will receive forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you said that promise is for us and our children and all whom the Lord our God will call. Lord, it's so clear from your word that every generation is promised a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Even as Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come. Those who believe in you, Lord, will out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Lord, another description of the Spirit's ministry, Lord. The Spirit satisfies our thirst. The Spirit satisfies our hunger. And Lord, we confess that we're thirsty. We're hungry for more of you in our lives. Father, wash away even now. Wash away, Father. Lord, the pain, even let the healing balm of Gilead. Thank you that the Spirit also is like oil. And Lord, oil is used often. Lord, as a symbol for your healing upon our lives. Thank you even now you're descending upon us. Just lift up your hands, Lord. We receive right now the healing balm of Gilead. Refreshing, renewing, restoring. Oh, thank you. Gracious Spirit, Lord, come. Thank you, Lord. You're, you're doing something in our hearts, our minds. You're casting out every disappointment, every life of the enemy saying, you're not for us. Breathe upon us afresh, Lord.